Hey guys, what's going on? Super excited to bring the one, the only Edmund McMillan on the podcast. Edmund, thank you got a lot going on right now. Thank you so much for carving out some time to come on the podcast. No problem. You tweeted and I did what I could. Hey, so you and I have gone back and forth a little bit, just having a good time on Twitter, but this is the first time we've had a chance to talk uh, face to face. But man, I just want to tell you, this is uh, for me personally, it's a big deal. You know, I've always uh, rooted for you and you, you know, it started back in the day, you know, I'm sure a lot of people watch you in indie game, the movie, but uh, you just came off as a very likable individual and really easy to root for. Um, it's, it's easy when you put me next to everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, I was worried when they were filming that thing. I was like, oh, I'm going to come off like a huge nut. No, but everybody else was, you know, in comparison, I guess. When when they were shooting that, <laughs> did you have any idea of the brevity or like how big that would be? Oh, yeah, no, of course not. It's kind of a weird situation because they were one of three different documentaries that were doing documentaries on indie games that came and interviewed me. That, they were the ones, they were, they, were, um, they were very young and motivated. So, like, I knew that it would be good because they seemed really professional. And they originally had kickstarted it. So they did, like, a, a really, really well-edited, well-cut video for the Kickstarter. And I was like, oh, okay, this could be... Because originally it was just going to be a talking heads, very dry PBS type situation where we're just going to talk about making games. But I guess they saw enough living, breathing things happening that they thought, okay, well, we'll keep following these guys and keep checking in and we're going to be here for launch. We're going to be here for that. I mean, they were there. It was nice to, for them to just be around because it felt nice to not be alone during all those times. Um, they, they were, they're very low stress, super mellow. And I had a feeling that it would be a great movie, but I didn't think that many people would care about it, you know? Well, you know, I don't want to assume anything, but I imagine up until that point in your life, you hadn't had a lot of cameras around you. What was that like for you to have a camera like in your living space? Was that like an adjustment for you or how did you handle that? Um, probably like a few months before that, I did have a bad situation with the camera in my house, which is kind of it, uh, Nintendo had me come and do a promo for a WarioWare game. And I was a little worried that it was going to be the same thing. And that was grueling. That was, I mean, it was essentially acting. You asked, you asked me to act. I can't act. Like, you, you want me to answer the door and say, come on in. It's like, <laughs> I feel like a freaking idiot. Like, what am I, what am I doing? Um, but this is a situation where they're just, they're Canadian. So they're very mellow, <laughs> like just so easygoing. And they were so caring and gentle that the majority of the movie, I'll look at the, I'll look at the footage and I'll, I don't remember that. Like, I don't remember saying that on camera. I don't remember them being in the car with me. They were, they're just, they just fade away. And, it, and I didn't feel like I was looking at a camera for the most part. I was also very sleep deprived at the end of that movie at that point. So I don't remember much. <laughs> when you, when you look back at that time, do you look at it as like, you feel grateful that it was documented, you know, on such, you know, to be behind the scenes. I mean, it was such a huge moment you know, for indie games to be there? Or were you kind of like, I wish that wasn't covered in hindsight? No, no. I mean, I have no regrets um, at all with it. I think they just did a fantastic job. And it was, you know, it, it really showed what was going on, even though, you know, you can't, you can't get the full reality of what's going on because there are NDAs and you, you can't actually be there 24-7 with the person. And, you know, uh, a movie that takes a month to watch isn't going to be the most intended thing, <laughs> thing in the world. So... Um, yeah, I think I did. I think they did a good. They did a good job. Um, the only negative was I think a lot of people, and it, not necessarily their fault, but a lot of people came off thinking that everybody in the movie just fell out of the sky, and they it may a few times people would come up to me and saying, "Hey, I've got a wife and kids, and I used to work for EA, but now I quit because I saw the movie, and I'm going to be making indie game." And it's just like <laughs> I'm not responsible for any of this. Like that's not that's not what I'm. Uh, recommending you do, you know, um, because it's such a, I mean, you should, you would see it from the movie. It's a very stressful, isolating, lonely thing to do with your life. It is rewarding. And if you're an artist, especially like, you know, I, I can't do anything else. So, uh, I have to, to continue to live, um, makes me feel good. Uh, but I think a lot of people may have gotten too jazzed by the idea of the possibility of having success, um, with indie games and maybe jumped in and sacrificed a lot without realizing that the majority of us had been ma have been working in games for 10 plus years at that point and um, made a great deal of sacrifice beforehand. So there's the stepping stones are kind of there. They, they allude to some things, but for the most part, I think a lot of people miss that 
most of us have been around for a very long time. Well, th that's when I want to take a step back and kind of write your, or at least observe your comic book story number one. Because I know, you know, just doing a little research, your first game came out in like 2001 versus, you know, 2012 and that, or 2011, when all that stuff started happening. So for yeah. you, how did you go from, you know, high school student to like, what was your first step to say, hey, I want to make games? And then physically, what did you do about it when you decided that's what you wanted to do? Um, I didn't ever know I wanted to make games and I, I fell into it not realizing I was making games. I made comics, which is kind of funny how you started this. I made comics first. <laughs> uh, that's what I did. That was my primary independent, you know, outlet. That's, I didn't know, it wasn't really realistic for me to make a good living off of making comics, but I made enough to make more. Um, and I did that from age 15 to 18. Um, and then I started getting frustrated. The fact that I, you know, you'd actually physically print these things at Kinko's and, and stuff like that and then put them in stores locally. And you wouldn't get any actual, you wouldn't know if you wouldn't see the joy in somebody's face. You wouldn't see the numbers. You, you just, who, who knows if somebody just stole it or ripped it apart for all I know. And that did happen a few times. Do you remember but, how, um, do you remember how you got it in the first stores? Did you just go to a comic book store and say, Hey, will you like, is it done on consignment? How, how did you do that? You know? As a... Yeah, I, I am. Uh, I the number one thing that I think every independent person or every person in the world should do is always ask. Just ask if you want something, and, and you think, you know, I wonder if this. I wonder. If, just ask. I asked. Um, I asked one place. Hey, can I sell my 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 comics in your store? They're a little adult, and they're like, sure, we'll put it behind the counter, and they did. And then I was like, well, okay. And I just kept going around asking, and that's that's basically what I how I got shit done. Like even at school, the first couple prints of my first and second comic, I just asked one of the teachers, Hey, can I use your copy machine? Sure. I mean, you'd be surprised how many people would be into somebody who's just driven and doing their own thing. Um, so I did a lot of that. I did a lot of asking <laughs> and a little bit of stealing when it came to Kinko's, but uh, <laughs> they, they'll, <laughs> they, they'll forgive me. Okay. So you go from kind of getting your comic book out there and you're selling and making a little bit of money. And then do you get to a point where you're like, hey, I can't sustain a life doing this? Or what was your next step in your progression of your career? Yeah, I I tried. It was around the time when like John and the Homicidal Maniac and a bunch of other comics were becoming pretty popular. And um, I thought, oh, I can hit up that publisher and maybe I have a chance. And I got a rejection letter. It wasn't harsh, but it was crushing. It was like my first early rejection where I felt like, I really can't do this. Like there is no future in this for me. Like this is what I do though. I, I, I write and I draw and how am I going to reach people? And I decided um, in the very late nineties to learn like a basic HTML web design stuff. And I said, okay, well I'll just put myself online. So thousands of people will see it. I, you know, I'm not going to make any money off of it, but so many people will see it. And um, I took a few classes at community college. I failed all of them, but I got what I needed. And I went home and I, <laughs> and I made my own website, which was called This is a Cry for Help, which is the same name as my comics. And I started putting up my comics. Um, I put tons of comics up. And I started seeing thousands and thousands and thousands of views. And it just goes up and up and up. And then I started putting ads. And back then, before the crash of 2000, um, you would make 25 cents a click which is insane. Yeah. I know, right? <laughs> so, so I was like, I was living with my grandma at the time and um, I remember getting my first check for like 500 and something dollars and my, my website wasn't big. And I'm thinking, oh my God, this is it. <laughs> this is my future. And then the next month, the check was $100. And then the next month, like it went from 25 cents to 10 cents to one cent to uh, every certain, every hundred impressions, you get a point whatever cent. Um, and then the only thing you can make money off of was porn ads, which was only if people would sign up, you get a dollar. And I think I made 50 bucks still a month off of just those ads for quite a while. But again, it was just like, oh, here's my future. And then oh, everything's <laughs> crumbling. Um, and Did you have to get a job or you just kind of like you kept your I always had a job? Yeah, yeah. I, I've worked many jobs over the years, but um, back then I was probably working at GameStop. I worked there on and off for quite a long time. What other like uh, non-artist jobs did you have? So you GameStop, what, like what else did you I do? I worked in a factory. I worked in a factory with my dad. It was terrible. What did you um, make? Really or, terrible. What kind of factory? Made, uh, it was a washer. It, they made washer parts. Okay. 
Like, were you on the line, like, <laughs> assembling called, them? Yeah, 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 assembling them with yeah, a bunch of mentally ill people and people who couldn't drive. From It was it was insane. It was I, I had to watch a woman eat her boogers all day long. She was always in front of me, and she would just go to town, and there's nothing you could <laughs> All you could do is just put your head down and put the gears together and grease the gears and move on. I did that for a few weeks and it was crushing. It was a, I don't know how people can do that. Um, I, I did that. I worked at Blockbuster for over a year. Uh, I was an animal control officer for over a year. What is what, I, an, animal control? Like you're going to like remove animals from a situation or what does that mean? Yeah, I wish it was, I wish I got to do more things like that. I was kind of the whipping boy cause I was the noob and uh, they put me on deads, which means I scrape up animals and I make sure they don't own they aren't owned by somebody so you you scoop them you scan them and you bring them and you 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 dump them essentially um and there were some i mean it was a great job i love that job i actually got fired from that job and that was the thing that caused me to break away again and decide okay i'm going to try to make a career in, in art again because i can't i just can't work a regular job like a regular person like it's it's too stressful to know that my future is in somebody else's hands and somebody could just screw me over at any point or just say i'm not useful it was just very frightening to me and I wanted to be in control of it. So I did what I could after that. Um, I, I mostly worked for free. I did a bunch of free illustration work um, and I started really pushing. Um, Flash was usually was originally used for um, web design stuff. So you made web, websites with Flash and it had minor interactive properties. So you could make buttons, you could click and drag and stuff like that. I started making games, which I didn't realize were games. Um, I really hated programming, though, and I eventually started working with somebody else who was a programmer. His name was Calder, and we made a bunch of Flash games. And I didn't even consider this as a career. I couldn't make money off of it. I couldn't make money off of any of my games for five-plus years. I didn't make any a dime off of them um, until the mid-2000s when you started. people started doing sponsorships. And that's how you'd make some money. And that died off eventually, too. I want to take a half but, step back. You said you did free illustrations. What, like... Yeah. How did that go down? Did you see a project that you liked? You're like, did you like say, "Hey, I want to get involved," or did people reach out to you? How did you do that? I, uh, I basically, I made a deal with myself that every day I would do one thing to further my career in some way. If it was emailing somebody or trying to get a better piece for my portfolio or anything like that, because you're literally, I'm a guy with uh, a a big portfolio of dick jokes essentially <laughs> like my old pornography you could say like my work back then was just you know bottom of the barrel not nice stuff and i couldn't really show that to somebody and be like hire me look i can draw a dick really well it's like i i needed something so i literally started looking at local places i would just go through online and search for local places and i would say hey this is who i am um here's some mild stuff that i could show you i am capable i'm a good illustrator um, you know, I specialize in like character design and logo design. Can I do a logo for you for free? Because I'm going to put it in my portfolio. And I did like five or six of those locally. And through those, I actually got jobs. Um, one of the jobs that I got, uh, was at a place called chronic logic, which was an independent game studio. And I, I, I volunteered my time there. They liked me and they started paying me for illustration work. And that eventually turned into me pitching a game to them called Gish um, in 2003. And um, for whatever reason, they thought it was a good idea. And they jumped on it. And, and me and Alex um, Austin uh, made Gish um, over like an eight-month period. We're, cel we're celebrating the 15-year anniversary of its release this year. That's pretty amazing. So, but without you reaching out to them and doing something for free, that is it safe to say that game doesn't get published? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, everything, uh, majority of my career came from being, I mean, you gotta be realistic. Like, I am a pretty realistic person. And I, I could see very clearly that people weren't just gonna trust me. And, you know, I, I didn't go to school, you know, I didn't go, I didn't have any piece of paper that said I was good. But I knew I was good enough. So I needed to essentially whore myself out for a little bit in order to get what I needed. And, um, I know people are very against that now. I know that people are like, no, never, never, no, never work for, for nothing. And I'm, I'm, I can totally get behind that. But when you're just starting out and you have nothing and you need to make contacts and you need to become relevant in some way, you, you got to do what you got to do. And I emailed hundreds, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different local, local places trying to do free work. And I would maybe get one or two responses. 
And I did it, and I did it every day, and I did it as much as I possibly could. And eventually, that's how I started making a living, even though I still worked part-time at um, GameStop until almost until the release of Super Meat Boy. Um, I, uh, I just did what I could, and I got the contacts I got, and I was able to be self-sustainable. You know, of course, with the help of my wife as well. She, she picked up half of the rent as well. Well, that's, that's the big debate online is that, you know, you have people that want to do some, something or create something, and they don't have anything, but then they're like, they don't want to work for free. And that's why I find it interesting from your perspective is that by doing things for free, you gained experience, a portfolio and context that got you to where you, you are today. And so I know it's tough to tell someone to work for free, but eventually, you know, it, it's just interesting to hear your perspective that that's what you went through. Yeah. And I know I hear that a lot too, especially with internships, and but I don't know. I mean, Maybe other people, other people have different experiences, but for me, this was a crucial part in my career, and I simply wouldn't have the experience that I do, or the portfolio that I did, or gotten the contacts that I did, like without that. And it's just one of those situations where, if you don't, if you can't prove your worth, and you just want to show people that you're good, you could just volunteer a couple of days. You know, you could show them what you got, and if they say no, you still got a portfolio piece. If it doesn't go anywhere, you still got something to show for. Um, I don't know. I mean, I could be totally wrong here. And this could have just worked for me because I'm maybe more of a social person. And I tend to, like I said, I ask for things. Yeah. You know, it's, it wasn't like these people were handing me jobs. It's like, <laughs> hey, that cover, that cover of your magazine kind of sucks. You know, if you want somebody else to do that, I can do that. And that's how I got that job. And it's, you know, as simple as that. It's like, ask, ask as much as possible. Show people that you care about what you're doing. Um, and I, you know, that I think that works for basically everything, but it's definitely how I stand with the games that I make. You know, if I'm not excited about what I'm working on and it doesn't show, no one else in the world is going to be excited about it. Why should they? Um, so I try, you know, try to be honest and enthusiastic. Yeah. So, so we kind of jumped a little bit. So you're, you're doing that. You're, you're working for illustrations. You're developing flash games. You get to a point where, you know, when did you, so you, you're doing these Flash games and then you get to Gish. What happened between those two things to say, hey, I'm just kind of making these things that you don't know are games to, hey, I'm, I'm now sitting down and pitching a, a developer or a publisher? Had, um, so Tom Fulp, who was the creator of Newgrounds.com, um, he also made Castle Crashers and Alien Hominid. Um, really, really great, fantastic guy. It was hugely influential in the industry and he doesn't get enough credit for that. Um, he... Uh, he buddied up with me at one point when I started making games and I asked him, um, you want to make a game with me? And he said, sure. And we started making this game called Serious P Shy. We worked on it for a few months. And around the time where I, I got the job at Chronic Logic, uh, he told me that he was sorry, but he could no longer work on the game because he's working on this console project called Alien Hominid. And which is funny because it would, it would eventually go head to head in the, um, in the IGF, uh, years later, uh, and uh, we shouldn't have won, but we did. Um, <laughs> uh, Alien Hominid is far more significant. But that it was that loss. It was it was crushing. It was like ah, like I had such high hopes for this game. You know, not financially because it was flash game. You can't money make money off of it. But it was like I was making this game with this guy who was very prominent in the industry at that time with Flash, and uh, it was going to be on Newgrounds, and everybody's going to love it, and it, it was going to be this really vast platformer and whatever else. But it was that crushing blow that made me go, well, what am I going to do now? I'm working with these guys who make games. You know, maybe I can pitch something. And I, I based it around their strengths. Um, Alex is a physics programmer, so all of his games are physics-based. And I thought, well, could I make a platformer? Because I still wanted to finish a platformer. Can I make a platformer that was all physics-based using what he's really good at? Like, how could I compliment him in that way? And I, I did this crazy... I even have it. And if you want me to show yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I have the design document over here. Oh. That's the good stuff, man. Dude, what talk about just a humble dude, man. Just I have super excited to have him here. Of the anniversary, so I started scanning all this stuff. I want to do something for it by the end of the year, but um, you keep all your original stuff. I try to. Um, so, like, here's some of the original sketches for gish i had them of course my my design was like 10 times uh what actually was in the game <laughs> but i tried my best to like be like well he could turn 
he could turn into a bubble. He could he could split in half, and he could do this and that and whatever else. But is the that foundation of it? Is that like the original original or a copy of the original? This that's the original original. Wow. This is this is it. Uh, here's the basic one, and this is this is basically what Alex went with. So all this stuff made it in for the most part, where he would you know stick to the walls, climb up the walls, hang from the wall, squish down, slide around, and jump. Um, and that was it. I mean, that's essentially it. Like, I, I don't know why they listened to me, but for whatever reason they did. And my whole career kind of spawned from that point. Real quick, looking at a design doc for someone that has no experience in doing that. How did you get to that point? Had you done that a hundred different times or a hundred different, like, uh, I had no idea what I was doing. You're just like, this. I was trying to be as professional as possible <laughs> because I saw them as professionals compared to me. And that's like, I got to make this look good. I got to do my pitch. You know, it's got to be great. You know, I made comics so I can make it look pretty. And I thought, okay, I'm just going to really, I'm going to do it. I'm going to convince them that this is a good idea and I'm going to make it look really spicy and whatever else. And I, I've never drawn a design document for any of my other games <laughs> <laughs> ever. Um, I sketch a few ideas down on paper and I piece them together in my mind for the most part. Uh, at this point, but that for that, you know, that was my first one and my only one. So you pitched it and then do they give you a, a yes on the spot or like, hey, we need to think about it. Do you remember what they said? I remember at the time there were three of us in the office, Josiah and Alex and Alex was very quiet and stoic. Um, I knew he did all the programming, so I knew he was the guy to win over. And I went I went through Josiah because I wasn't really you know, tight with him and they were really good friends. And through Josiah, I just kind of swooped around and I, I don't know, like I just, I pitched it to Josiah and Josiah pitched it to Alex and, you know, within a day or two, I came in and there was this physical blob, blobbing around. It was all wireframe and I was like, oh my God, like this is, <laughs> this is for real. And once we had a, like a prototype within the first two months, we entered it in the IGF, which is the Independent Games Festival. And uh, we got in and, and it, which meant that you could show your game there to like hundreds of people on the show floor. Holy shit, that was like the most amazing experience. And it still stands out as one of the best experiences of my life. Like seeing peop the joy in people's faces playing this game just changed everything. It's like, oh, this is what I want to do. Like I, I feel it felt like a new frontier. Like no one artistically was doing much with, with games at this point because it was so mass marketed. It was so watered down and... I had a perspective that was so strange and odd, and I felt like I could really stand out. Um, so I thought, okay, this is it. This is what I'm doing, and this is the future. We didn't win that year, but we entered again in 2005, and we did win. Um, and then from then on, it was doing what I could as much as I could, and I started to make money off of my games. And, and when you win, does that mean that someone backs you or a collective backed you to make the game? Like, what is winning the IGF? What does that mean to you as a game yeah, developer? It, it was... Uh, people don't, it's probably not taken as much as seriously now, but back in the early 2000s, there, the industry was very small. And the majority of like the prominent people now were, were around then. Like I, I made friends with the majority of prominent, like Derek Yu, Terry Cavanaugh, um, Matt Thorson, uh, Tom Fulp, Dan Paladin, like all those guys were around the end guys. Um, all those games were in the IGF. And that's kind of where you congregated. And there was a really nice camaraderie back then, too. There wasn't there was no dividing it. We were all really tight and everybody, you know, was was just jazzed to be making games and, and, and doing this and possibly making a living off of it. There wasn't much of a living to be made then. You could put your game up online. You put it on your website. There's no portals or anything. Um, you put your game on your website. You sell it for nineteen ninety nine, which was everybody always sold. Doesn't matter how big the game was. It was nineteen ninety nine. And uh you know, if you're lucky, maybe maybe Penny Arcade would post, and they did. And I remember when they posted about Gish, um, and we got our record-breaking sales of 100 and, 103 units or 107 units. And on one day? day? In one day. Yeah. And it was like, oh, my, we, like, wrote it on the wall, and it was, like, amazing. It was super awesome. And then the next day, I think we sold 98, and then it just died. <laughs> that was the end of that. But, it, you know, slowly but surely, the, the doors started opening up and by 2007, 2008. 2008 was the big boom where it was like suddenly indie games were on console and, and I, you know, all my friends are millionaires. You know, it's uh, it was it was surreal. And I was like, oh, shit, I got to really I got to do something. I got to take advantage of the fact that, you know, consoles are console people are looking at looking at this stuff.
So while this is going on, while you're developing Gish, IGF, all that stuff, are you still working another job or a side job during this? Or are you all 100% in, like, no life in it, like, expenses down? Yeah, I'm still working at GameStop. Okay. I was working at GameStop until, like, um, a year and a half before I started development on Super Meat Boy. It went from, um, like, two, by 2007, mid-2007, sponsorship flash stuff started to become significant and you could get a couple thousand dollars off a of sponsorship and i worked really fast and so i could make a bunch of really small games and i made a bunch of significant games like um like triacnid coil time fuck ether the c word and a few others and they were all like in one year and i got them sponsored and i think i made i think i made like close to 28 or 30 grand which is the most i've ever made uh back then and uh I was I used that to fund Super Meat Boy, like that's how I that's how I survived. So I doubled down all all that stuff. I quit my job um, once I saw the money coming in, uh, and I started saving as much as I possibly could. I think I made it out with a, a few thousand dollars in the bank to to work on uh, Super Meat Boy because I thought it would just take a year, but it ended up taking two, which kind of crushed us. But we I sold all my Nintendo games, I sold all my DVDs, I sold everything, and I was able to. And Danielle, of course, worked. My wife worked a bunch in double time, uh, and and she ended up selling a bunch of plushes to kind of keep our keep both of our heads uh, above water. But, J you just put everything you could into the development and lived as lean as possible to just see it yeah. through. Well, I mean, uh, if you're an artist, you got to learn to live poor. Like I grew up poor, and it's not too bad. Like you, you do what you can, and I I never felt like I was going without. Like I still, you know, if I if I wanted a box of the new Magic set then it meant I needed to do more contract work. You know, it's just the, the trade-off there and time for the most part. But yeah, you live really cheap. You eat top ramen and you put yourself in the hospital with uh, gallbladder surgery, which was what I did during development because all I ate was the $5, $5 um, uh, Little Caesars pizza. $5, it's $5. <laughs> That's why we might not have it for like dinner. Come on. Like, so, why not? So we're not giving nutritional advice on the podcast. I do want to take just one half step backward. Can you tell me what like a 24 hour period would look like just cause I want to give people context of what you were doing while you were working at GameStop and working on games. Like what you would work from like eight to four and then from five to whenever you would work on your games. What would your day to day look yeah, that's, like? That was usually what it is. And there was a, there was a point too, where I was still working with Alex and we had, um, we had an office downtown, which I had to pay for half of the rent for, and then my own rent at home. So I would have to, Work a little at GameStop. You know, I get shifts or whatever I possibly could because there's a lot of people there. Um, and then when I wasn't working there, I was working downtown with with Alex. Um, and then when I got home, I worked at night. And that's where I did most of my contract work. And then I also tried to find time to do my flash work, which meant I don't know how I I don't know why my wife stayed with me because <laughs> like it was gnarly then. Like there there was a good three years where all I was doing was working. And I'm the type of person that uh it's like the chaos keeps me sane like if you f i want to fill my brain with as much complicated things as possible and then i don't have to have anxiety or think about it for the most part so it's a more comfortable environment for me if i just work myself to death um, and that's what i was doing but i needed to make a career and, and i you know i was getting older and i wanted to be able to to I didn't want my wife to keep working the shitty job that she was working and I wanted to be able to help us and I wanted to do something with my career and I wanted to try and I saw everybody else doing it. So I just thought, okay, well, I'll sacrifice as much as possible and, and hope that she'll be understanding. And for the most part, she was not to say there wasn't horrible fights and a lot of, I only see your back and when are we going to go out to eat <laughs> or when are we going to like interact or can we go to the beach? But I'm making up for that now. So, but during those three years, I mean, you're not like watching, binge watching series. You're not playing through a 40 hour RPG. It's like all your free time for the most part is going into your career. Oh yeah, for sure. For sure. <laughs> so did, so how did you convince your wife at the time? Like, did she just see the drive and you're like, yo, this is what makes you happy. Do it. Or I wish she was here. I mean, that's a good question to ask. I don't, um, I guess I made up for it elsewhere. <laughs> I, don't, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I'm a sincere person, and I and I think I understood, and I think she saw she saw I, she saw the potential, and she would say that too. And she she knew that she always said, oh, you know, that she I knew you'd become something, you know, 
you, what you, people like what you're doing and you're, what you're doing is significant. And that, I mean, that was, of course, a motivator to do it too. But it could have all, I could have crashed and burned. I mean, not to say that like, there were some terrible nights where I was trying, you know, at night, you're up thinking, okay, this is how much we have in the bank. And so we can, I can live for one month if I somehow got sick or I couldn't find any, like leaning on contract work was so stressful, like trying to find illustration work and hoping that I'm going to make enough money to pay rent. And then looking at savings and be, trying to quantify like, okay, I can live for three more weeks. And if I don't find any work, then we're screwed. And I'm going to have to try to, and I couldn't really borrow money from anybody because my family's poor. And, uh, and we live in Santa Cruz, which is like one of the most expensive places to live in the United States. But you know, you just fucking do it. For you, where does that drive come from? Because looking at all that stuff in the face, you know, eating not very good food, working your face off, you know, not spending a ton of time with your significant other, other there comes a certain amount of drive. Either, like, where did that come from for you? Did it come from not wanting to go back and working on the factory with the lady picking her nose, or was it something else? Uh, if I'm being honest, I would say I didn't want when I'm um, not being creative, I go to a really dark place and I get really depressed and I'm not a good person to be around. And it, my major motivator was to stay alive. Like I need to make myself happy. And I, sometimes I think that like, maybe I'm just the type of person that requires more than most people to continue to live and feel like life is worth it. And, and you know, that just made me have to work harder. I don't know if you can hear my my daughter is screaming for yeah. reason in the background. Yeah, no, I can hear it. I, I got a couple of questions about you regarding her. But before that, when did you, like, did you explore that? Or when did you become self-aware, like, hey, no art, miserable human? <laughs> was she, yell, is she yelling for you? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. I haven't gotten a text from my wife, so that's, that's good. Okay. Everything's okay. What, like, did you do some exploration? Or when did you become self-aware, like, no art, miserable unhappy human to hey when i'm doing art i'm very happy like it was apparent from when i was little like i was i was that really nervous like i had ulcers when i was five you're five what is she doing here one <laughs> yeah yeah right. uh, let me just make sure everything's okay down there oh she stopped <laughs> of course when i stopped talking um yeah uh as a kid i um you know, struggled with terrible anxiety and I guess depression. And I, you know, I had a rough childhood and, um, I just required more, I guess I required more to, to be happy and stay motivated. And in doing so, like, I just, I, I was always honest with myself and what I needed and honest with other people. And, uh, I, I needed to do this. There was no other question if, if, you know, I just didn't feel relevant. I felt like a, a ghost, like I might as well not exist. And like, so as a kid, were you like sketching and painting and, and drawing or, you know, how did you, like as a kid, unless someone shows you, Hey, here's an outlet. How did you remember how you figured it out? Like, or, um, I feel like a lot of people struggle to like, someone may feel like you, but they haven't identified, Hey, this is what it like. Here's an outlet for me. Do you remember how you got to that point? I just remember not being good at anything except for drawing. Um, I'm dyslexic. So like in school, anything written, anything reading was a struggle. I got held back in first grade. I had to go to special classes. Like I had to go, you know, I always felt like a, a dumb kid. Like I, I did when all the classes, the dumb kids went to, you know, and everybody made it very apparent to me that that's what I was. So I always felt just like a weirdo outcast, but the one thing that I could do was draw. And the one thing that people said that I was, was creative. So I just doubled down on those things and felt like, okay, well, I'll embrace the fact that I'm a weirdo and I'm an outcast. Um, but I'm good at this and I can, I, I just, I guess I found ways to speak about myself through my work pretty early on. And, um, it felt good to do and it made me feel happy and it made me feel relevant to have other people compliment that and say like, oh, I really like this thing that you did because nothing else I did was, was getting that. I was one of those kids who was constantly in the office. You know, I was always in trouble. And, and now it's, I mean, you seem like a very confident individual right now, but even when you were talking about coming up and, and you felt like you had this confidence of being good at something, like when you were explaining when your early development, even to me, you're like, hey, I knew this was good. I just needed to find someone 
you know, to get exposure for it or when you were doing free work. But how did you know it was good based on your own assessment versus other people versus the feedback yeah, you I got? Mean, what for the most part, um, what I was seeing um, when it came to like T-shirt illustration or, or magazine work, I would just say, you know, can I do better than this? Yes. I, you know, I can do better than that. Um, and I guess confidence was just from doing like from experience and and feeling like, OK, I can make this comic and I can do that. Like I can make a comic. And it, it wasn't like one like, how do I make a comic? It's like, I'm just going to make a comic. I'm going to figure it out myself because I'm confident enough with my I don't know. I guess I I guess I always had some amount of confidence in my creativity um, because, I mean, my imagination was the most comfortable place to live. So, you know, it, I, yeah. <laughs> I was good at go. I was good at going there. Yeah. So, OK, so let's I, and I'm sure you've talked about this a lot, but just to give context. So Meat Boy comes out and at what point, like when it hits, are you like, holy like this is you know, a decade of my life and now it's like hits, like, did it, do you remember that moment when, you know, you're looking at the sales numbers and it's not 103? Like, do you remember that? I remember some of that. The, the most significant thing I remember is the first time we cashed the check, the first check that we got. <laughs> and then I went to the bank and I went inside and I, I asked them if they could print it out for me. Cause I wanted to show Danielle in the car and she was waiting for me. And I was like, I was just in another place and I remember getting in and sitting down in the car and going like, look at this and seeing her and seeing an Asian woman in the car with me and realizing I got somebody else's car <laughs> and that the woman thought I was going to murder her. Like <laughs> I'm in a bank parking lot and I'm a big guy and I like just open up the door and sit down and go, look at this <laughs> to this woman that, that's all alone in the car. And I look back and there's a baby in the back and I'm like, Oh my God, I'm so sorry. Um, that was a pretty surreal experience and that kind of summed up how I felt. Like I felt like I wasn't in reality. Like it seemed completely unreal. And I remember, um, I remember we had hoped and prayed and we, we asked a lot of different people who, who had released games around that time being like, you know, what do you think we can do? What can we expect? Because of course I wanted there to be some kind of payout. Like at the very least I thought we can, I looked into like, I needed like eight, eight or nine grand to put down on a mobile home, um, locally. And that's, that was our, that was the high end. That was like, if everything goes well, we can, we can do this. And, you know, there was a lot of pressure and everybody was like rooting for me. And I remember when John Blow was like, he's going to sell a million units. And I was like, shut up. Like, don't, you're dooming it. Like you're, don't say that. Don't say that with such confidence. Cause it's all going to go downhill from here. And I'm going to, you know, make everybody feel terrible. Like I let everybody down. Like, um, I felt like that a lot, but, yeah, it was um, it was surreal. I mean, before that, there there was a moment too where I felt like I had kind of guess made it in a way, which was uh, a year and a half before we started development on Super Meat Boy. I did a compilation uh, CD. I printed it myself and self funded it, and uh, I sold it off of off of my website for the most part. My my, my wife shipped everything. She did all the shipping and stuff. And it was a collection of everything that I had done from when I was 15 till I was 25. So like 10 years of work and on all on one disc. And I put it up, made a trailer for it and everything. And it actually sold out. And I was like, what? Like, how did it sell? I think it was like 500 copies or something. How did I sell? Or maybe more. How did I sell it out? Like, this is so crazy. And through that, I started getting, finding out people had been talking about it and like, you know, prominent people in the industry. And through those prominent people, like I reached out, I saw somebody talking to me like, Oh, thanks so much for, for buying and supporting me. And they're like, Oh, I've been following you to the, the, you know, since Gish or whatever else. And, uh, you know, do you need a, and well, they don't even ask me that I said, well, do you have a contact in the industry? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and one of those people was, was Cliffy B. Um, and, uh, he bought the CD and he was like, you know, he, I think he, he gave me a quote and said like something about, he appreciates my drive or something along those lines. And I asked him, I said, do you have a, do you have a contact at, at uh, Microsoft and um, him? And I, I, I feel terrible for not remembering his name, somebody from the Bioshock team as well. Both of them at the same time, cause I'm doubling up as, <laughs> as much as I possibly can. Both gave me a contact at, um, at Microsoft and it would ended up being the same guy who published like Castle Crashers and, and all the big names. Um, and his name's Kevin. He's, he was amazing. And, uh, 
through that. Then I started, there was a time where I, I, I met Reggie at the IGF, got a picture with him or whatever else. And, uh, I said something like, I want, I want to talk, I want to talk with you about getting my on, on the Wii, I think at the time. And he's like, Oh yeah, sure. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to hold you to that. I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going 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 to message you. I'm going to find a way to contact you. And he's like, Oh yeah, I'm, you know, just, just ask this person. I just, I couldn't find him, but I, I had the number that he gave me for the general area and I would call him and I call him every day. And I started recording myself calling him and I po- posted it online about every, cause every time it was, he's, he's in meetings, he can't talk to me, yada, yada, yada. I posted that video and Dan Edelman, who was the main guy uh, behind a lot of indies that were on any Nintendo platform, he was the indie game guy. And he's like, oh, if you're really, if you're serious about this, I'm the guy to talk to. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, let's talk. So I just started, I just started rapid firing. Like I, I took every opportunity I could um, and I got contacts in all the major um, area and all the major consoles and I started developing and that was basically it. I did what I possibly could, all I possibly could. So that that email you asked for from Cliffy B was that the reason you you kind of, you got routed through the Xbox to get mm-hmm. your game, and all because you asked. If you do you think yourself, if you don't ask those two guys for a contact, does Meat Boy yeah, not come to three? You know, no. Yeah, and every all of these are going to come down to me asking for something. And just hoping not to say like I ask for tons of stuff and people say no all the time. Yeah. But these, these guys happen to say yes. And uh, yeah, no, it's super significant, like super significant. So real quick, did you sell your compilation for 1999? I don't think I did. I don't remember what I sold it for. Maybe I did. Maybe I did sell it for 1999. It was a physical disc though. Um, I don't, I don't know. I don't remember. So, so that was kind of like your first, like, your kind of making it moment was when you sold out of all that. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So then, okay. So then meat boy comes through smashing success. And then at that point, are you like, Hey, this is like a one hit wonder. Let me hang on to it. Or <laughs> was it like a vote of confidence where it's like the world's your oyster. You can do whatever you want. For me, it was kind of like, uh, now I have money. So not to say that, I was selling out with Meat Boy, obviously, because it's still weird and, you know, it's still me and it, whatever. What do you mean it's but weird? I was, well, it's strange. It's, it's, it's an odd game that you wouldn't see in the mainstream. Like you couldn't go up to somebody and pitch Meat Boy at that point in time to a company and they say that that's a good idea. Any of the themes in that game are a good idea or any way, she, the difficulty of the game, it, it's, it's not going to happen. But um, I was playing it safe. Um, Super Meat Boy was based off of a game called Meat Boy, a Flash game that I had released, and that was my most popular Flash game. I didn't, it wasn't my best, it was probably one of my worst, but whatever was in that showed signs that that would become popular if I made more of it. Um, and it was a simple platformer. So I thought, okay, I've made a lot of platformers, and this game sells, you know, not sells, but it, it, it millions of people played it, millions of people know who Meat Boy is for the most part at this point. Um, they like the characters, they like the vibe, I'm going to double down on this. And this is the game. Cause originally when they, when I was, when I was talking to Microsoft, the game that I was pitching was Gish was a remake of Gish and, uh, stuff fell through with the company and I ended up leaving and I switched it to super meat boy. And, and, and that was basically my pitch. It's like, okay, well I got this game and it's, it, it, there's millions of people that are playing it in flash. So let's do this. And they were like, okay, yeah, we just wanted to work with you, whatever you're working on. That's fine. Well, let's do it. What? And, um, but you had the insight to maybe that might not have been your first game to, that you wanted to to create, but because of, on the analytics you're like, hey, yeah, okay, yeah, I'm not, I'm not gonna it, see, I'm not gonna invest two years or at the year, the time I thought it was gonna be one, um, two years of my life on something that I that I didn't have some idea of a minimum guarantee, mm-hmm. you know, I, like oh. I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna. May, oh yeah, I'm gonna do some experimental art <laughs> game so I can make money off of that. Like I'm gonna do the most accessible game that pe- I know people already like, and I'm gonna keep it real simple. Platformers are easy to make. I know I can make them. I made quite a few, and everything was there. And we, ju- I just doubled down on it and did it. But after that, it was. I now I have a cushion of money. Like now I actually have the freedom to do whatever I want to do. What do I want to do? I want to do something risky and weird. Like I really want to do something really honest and and brutal in a way, you know, and not care about selling it. 
And I, so I was like, I'm just going to make another Flash game. Like, the sponsorships were dead for the most part. I had the option to, and the game I'm talking about is The Binding of Isaac, but I had the option to sell Binding of Isaac to Adult Swim for like 10, 10 grand, 18 grand. I don't remember what they were paying at that point to just buy IP. And I thought about it. I really considered it because I didn't think like, it's a Flash game. How am I going to sell this? Um, and yeah, I just, I buddied up with a guy that I had done Flash games with, Florian Himsel. Um, we had made a lot of, he, he's the go-to guy when it's like, Hey, I want to do something really risky that could ruin our careers. Are you down? And he's like, yes, I'm down. Like I made some very adult themed games with him. I've made some very, very dark games with him. And I was like, this is going to be weird. Like this is, we're going, we're going into uncharted territory with this. And the gameplay is going to be really bonkers. Um, you ready? And he's like, yes. And we worked on that for only three months. And I was like, yeah. It's good. I think it's cool. Like, and I started showing it to people, and people started saying this is special. Like, this is this is really cool. And it, and, and I think people were saying it's cooler than I than I thought it was. And I should not sell it to anybody. And I should put it on Steam. How close um, were you to selling it? To his- well, very, uh, very pretty pretty close because mostly because it was easy money for Florian. At that point had told me he was broke. He kept that from me for quite a while until the end of development. And he's like. I'm, I'm, I don't have any money and I need money. And I'm like, okay. And I think I ended up even sending him some money early on, um, to, to float him. Um, but you know, he's a very prideful person. He didn't want to say that he was dying for money because yeah. flash sponsorships had dried up. Like, and that's what he was doing for quite, quite a few years. And, uh, yeah, um, that was, that's, I did consider, I did consider cause it's a lot of money, it's still a lot of money and it's yeah. a guaranteed amount of money. And I had no fucking this game was going to become the most popular thing that I've ever made. But um, yeah, um, a few people said, this is good. And I was like, uh, and I remember sending the email to Steam like, hey, remember me? I made, I made that <laughs> Super Meat Boy game. <laughs> yeah, you know, it sold really well. Like I'm doing something risky and something really weird. And they're like, we like risky. We like weird. And we like your games. Like whatever you want to put on here, we can, we, we they gave me a free app. Back then, you, you didn't do it. They had to actually like contact somebody there, and they had to make an app for you, an app number, so you could actually upload something. And I remember when it finally, I remember going, like, I really hope that they're, you know, and I'm trying to pitch it as, I know it's in Flash, but, you know, it's gonna, I'm going to make sure it performs well. And, of course, it didn't. But, um, <laughs> like, we're going to do what we can to optimize it. And, and, yeah, it was just an instant yes. And I was like, awesome. And we just put it up. And... Initially, it did not. It didn't. It didn't sell too well. And then, like word of mouth, and everybody started playing it. And uh, within like six months, it just it was this very odd spike. Right? You know, most games look like this, where it's like boom, release day, and then brr, brr, all the way down, and then maybe sale, sale, sale. This one just looked like, and it just kept going, like yeah, like all the way up. And I'm like, what is going on? And it's people like started. Like once once summer hit the the year after I released it, um, kids started just eating it up. People were buying like crazy. And one of the things that really helped too is I sold it for five bucks because I thought no one's gonna buy this. I got to make sure it's cheap. And I only spent three months on it, so I don't want to overcharge. Um, and I remember putting up and saying like it has had over twenty hours of gameplay or ten hours of gameplay or something <laughs> like that, not knowing that people would keep playing it. It's still amazing to me that people are still playing it. It's kind of insane. When when you but, dropped it and it didn't like explode like Meat Boy, wh- do you remember thinking like, hey, you know, I gave it a shot? Or were you like upset? Were you just like, all right, next project? No, yo, no, I was like, I it, it was um it was better than I expected. Okay. My expectations were very low. Um, I mean, I kind of keep my expectations low overall, maybe subconscious, so I'm not disappointed. But I wasn't disappointed in any way. Um, I think IGN gave us a seven, which was a little harsh. I felt a little, it, it was a hard sell, you know, back then, like you tried to explain to somebody that this is the type of game that you replay and that's why it's fun. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And like, I remember, I remember talking to somebody, I can't remember in the press and saying, trying to describe the game. It's like the legend of Zelda. Um, but you know, w- when you die, you get to play again. And it's all new. Um, and they're like, well, but you, you keep your items and you die. No. And they're like, why would you, how is, how is that appealing in any way to try to explain to somebody like and, and the whole thing really came from wanting to play D as a kid and only getting as far as making my character and choosing all the spells and whatever else and then like just wanting to make a new character again instead of playing and 
I wanted to make this kind of bite-sized level up system where you could essentially max a character out in, you know, 20, 30 minutes of gameplay and, uh, and then you do it again. Um, and every time it, it feels like a, a unique character. Uh, it, it seemed really cool to me and it seemed untouched and I hadn't really ever seen a game like that, except maybe Diablo. But of course, Diablo, you play it for 20 hours before it got to that point. Um, and that's what I was going for. And I didn't think people would really dig it. And I tried to convince people of it. But for the most part, it was people playing it that, that kind of showed. And that's, and that, and kind of, that's what I'm, I'm feeling the exact same vibe with Bumbo. Because Bumbo is very similar. And like, it's hard for me to point to a game and say it's like that. Because it's kind of like Slay the Spire. It's kind of like Puzzle Quest. It's kind of like Dicey Dungeons. Maybe the closest to Dicey Dungeons. But it's also not really like that at all. It's a lot like Mighty of Isaac. Like, it's a replayable game, and it's a puzzle game. And people see it, and they see it as like, oh, it looks like Bejeweled, and I'm not going to like it. But it's good. <laughs> you <laughs> will like it. It's honestly one of my better games. And um, I think I think people I, – I, I don't know. We'll see, we'll see what happens. But I think it's very replayable. Um, maybe not as streamable as Isaac, because I know when I, when I stream – Oh man, like it's not the same as like doing a Twitch based game where you die or you get hit and whatever else. It's like, are people seeing what I should specifically, but the optimal play here? And all they're going to do is say, oh, line of five, bottom row, boy. You know, like, <laughs> like, oh my God. It's, I can't look at the chat because I need to just naturally do this. But it is a extremely strategic Isaac y type game. So before we talk about Bumbo, I just have a, a personal question to ask. When Isaac was coming out, are you the type of individual that like when you wake up in the morning, are you the first thing you're doing going to Steam sale and like saying like, how did it do last night? Like in the early days? Yeah, of- yeah. In the early days, for sure. Um, I remember doing that. I remember like feeling sick to my stomach with, with super, the Super Meat Boy time and I couldn't do it myself. And I'm just like, oh, yeah. I think I actually asked James, like James was one of the people that I asked, like, just tell me look at the numbers just tell me the numbers like it, I, I can't it makes me feel like i'm gonna barf when i like go and look at it and uh yeah I, I don't look anymore though um i try not to be motivated by that sort of stuff i try to just be more motivated by by the game and it's stressful still like i don't i don't want to put myself in that kind of headspace where i'm thinking about sales meaning being the number one thing you know because i just want to make cool games well just as a as a bystander especially just hearing your story it sounds like meat boy was kind of like retail Edmund McMillan and everything after then is kind of like, Hey, you're doing not that meat boy isn't you, but like you kind of like everything else is just on your directive. And yeah, I, I, yeah, I would, I'd say so. And it, and again, like I compromise in the best way possible when it to meat boy. Um, but from here on out, you know, <laughs> only the hardcore people are going to follow me around from here. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, there's in, um, playing it safe anymore at all like i i really want to do weird stuff and like the binding of isaac and like i don't know the, the game i'm not even satisfied with the amount of risks that i've been taking recently like i want to do really weird out there stuff like and there's been a few projects that i've picked up and put down um mostly for like legal or you know company weird company situations and stuff like that i couldn't work on it um in secret that were really really weird all type experimental stuff and i'd like to of course get back to that i know people don't want me to do that i know people don't care (laughs) they won't care about but there is a chance there's when you're when you're working in the really weird environment there's a chance of another binding of isaac you know like it there's a chance of another five nights at freddy's like who thought that that was going to be a thing like it's the only way you're gonna or baba as you or the goose game or like any any of that you know, they're just kind of new experiences that are so out there and weird, um, even genre defining stuff. Like I would like to, I would like to take more risks um, and possibly fail a few times in search of something greater in in search of something more uh, meaningful or op- open more doors and experiment with more things, which means usually making kind of smaller games, but well, we'll see what happens because the next thing I want to work on is Mugenix, and that's like a two-year project. So, well, so I think that's what a lot of people have the perception of of you, and, and maybe it's just me speaking from my my perspective. Is I know if I'm playing a game by you, it's unlike anything else. So regardless of it's something like Bumble, I'm like, okay, it's a match three, not my thing, but I'm still gonna try it because I know 
you make stuff that hasn't been done before. And I think that's the cool thing about you is like, we're not going to play a reskinned whatever on the next thing you come out. But I do want to put a bow on Isaac before we talk about the next chapter. Sure, yeah. So you have the third expansion coming out. Um, is that it? Like where, I mean, you've taken this thing to the nth degree and back again. Like how much <laughs> more do you see from that thing? It, like, is there still stuff up there? You're like, I, it, it, I got to get it on. Are you done? So, yeah, um, I should probably say that, like, I was I was kind of done after the after the first expansion. And then after birth plus was going to be this really little thing that I was pretty hands off with. And I just kind of, I, you know, I was going through my own personal stuff then and I kind of stepped away from. And then afterwards, I was like, gosh, ugh, things kind of got fucked up. And now I got to fix this and I got to pick up the pieces and kind of got back into it. And then I was done. And then um, Anti-Birth came out, which was a fan a fan made mod. And I saw it and I was like, holy crap. Like if I was working with these people on Afterbirth Plus, then it would have been amazing. Um, and I think for the most part, you know, not to say anything bad about the, the Nicholas team because they're they're great people and they're very competent, but I think they got a little tired of working on it. You know, they'd been working on Isaac for forever and they want to work on different projects. But uh, Vin, Nick and Sagittarius, who are the Anti-Birth team, they're living that game. Like... Vin knows the game better than I do. Like the fans know the game better than I do. And I'm completely, you know, that's the reality. That is the reality. Like I can't even remember the majority of the items I do uh, that I, and I made them and uh, uh, you know, and to, to, to see these guys do this and be like, Holy crap. And they did it. It's hard to explain, but they did it right. They did it in a way that you could tell that Vin knew everything that I had made and was a huge fan of mine because he did it in a really respectful way where he never crossed the line. Like everything fit perfectly for the most part. It was really surprising to me because I'd never really worked with somebody who got the aesthetic themes and where the lines to not cross. That's always really hard with Isaac because a lot of people are like, oh, it's so edgy and weird and whatever. But there are certain lines that you don't cross. Well, like people are always like, why don't you, are you going to fight God in the next one? It's like, no, you're never going to fight God. And I can't even explain to you why, but it's not appropriate for the game. And there's a lot of stuff like that. There's a lot of lines you don't cross that are unwritten. And for whatever reason, Vin saw those lines and he never crossed them. And I thought, wow, this is like, I need to work with these guys. Like this, you know, handing this game off basically to the fans, which is what we tried to do with the modding and out of out of that, like these people sprung up and it's like, oh, like I could be working with these people who are fans who know the game so well and we can make something awesome. So I wanted to I also wanted to be careful with it. So I wanted to test the water. I think about helping me with these booster packs and the CQ character that I want to do. And Vin's like, yeah, let's do it. I'm down with whatever you want to do. And it's like within months, like I realized that this guy is very meticulous, very, very meticulous, very detail oriented. and he was uh, awesome to work with, super awesome, and still is. And um, once once I had tested it and saw that I could work with these guys, um, basically asked Tyrone, like, "Hey, why not why not get these guys in? Why don't we why don't we purchase the Afterbirth IP basically and and turn it into its own thing?" And and I had a bunch of story elements and bosses and stuff like that that I was kind of holding for a possible sequel. I tend to write a bunch of um, sketches for different games and stuff that I might want to do in the future. And I was like, ah, fuck it. We'll just put it in. We'll just put it in here. And yeah, and it just grew and grew and it's still growing. And people are like, here, oh, but I'm telling you, you will be happy that it didn't come out this year because the, the expansion is phenomenal. It's really, really good. It is not only an expansion, but it is a quality of life upgrade to the game that will have you playing it forever. You shouldn't play it forever. So people gotta stop. <laughs> is it safe to say that that uh, repentance is the end period on Isaac as we know it? I assume so. I mean, and not to say that not, like what if yeah. what if Vin what if Vin's like I want to do <laughs> this expansion or what if I wake up with like a crazy idea that I want to mess with for the foreseeable future. I don't want to add anything more to this version of the game. If I do anything else. I would like it to be a sequel and I would like it to be five years down the road. Like not, not anytime soon. I, I want to stop thinking about Isaac. Um, I want to, you know, put a bow in it essentially. And that's one of the reasons why I also did Bobo too, because I wanted to be able to tell 
a story kind of before Isaac, like how Isaac became came to be sort of and give a new perspective on it. So I think with with Bamba, which is a prequel by New Isaac, and then Repentance, you get these bookends that really do sum up the experience and give you an idea of where it started and where it ends, uh, which is nice. So it kind of wraps it up in a little package that I feel really good about. So, okay. So now we get to Bumbo, which is coming out next week. And, you know, before you came to the podcast, you're still working on stuff. And I know you're still working on stuff to get it ready. But where does this fall in terms of your your love life of your kids in terms of Meat Boy, Isaac, Gish? Like, is this... This is something very different, but do you feel like, hey, this is something like, is this your favorite game you've worked on? I don't want to put words in your mouth. I would say if you asked me that question four months ago, I would definitely say um, because it took a long time for all the pieces of the puzzle to come into place. Like there were a lot of, there was a lot of um, on paper, this looks correct. Like all these mechanics look correct but they all have to be fleshed out and then they all have to be connected. And then it was the first time I was working in, in 3d and James did all the 3d stuff. Um, and thinking in 3d was a whole other thing for me, like aesthetically, like, how do I, what, what do I, I basically, James had to sit me down and be like, you can do this in 3d, like this, this, and this, like, think about how this, you know, you could manipulate a 2d character in 3d, like you could bend his head forward and you can, you can make him wrap around himself and whatever else. So it took a while to get everything in place. Um, and not about six months ago, it started, all the little wires started to connect, started to become this fleshed out game that I could mold and, and tweak and tune. And uh, I, I posted on my blog about this too, but we, we did a whole year of development, which was revolving around exploration because I thought, oh, it's a Binding Isaac game. You got to have room to room exploration. You got to have secrets. You got to have this and that. And we worked on that for a year and added it all in, traps and, and NPCs and all this stuff. And it bogged down the experience and it did not, it felt, it felt forced, it felt weird, and we just chopped it out. So we lost a lot of, a lot of development time. Just me being honest with the, with the game and being like, I'm not going to force this into a game it's not. It is a strategic puzzle game that is randomly generated um, in the vein of Isaac. And it wasn't appropriate to have exploration at all. It felt it bogged the game down completely. Like it, it felt terrible and it was hard to do. I remember telling when I told, him, but I, you said the word, <laughs> I did all this stuff. Like all this stuff is out. No, no, cut it. We got to cut it. We got to cut it. But he's also an artist. So I think he, he totally got it too and understood like it, it was what's, what was best for the project. But it, the development was the longest and hardest development. I think I've, I've, I've gone through um, when it came to just, game design because it's i never worked on a puzzle game before and um i didn't realize how boring um working on a turn-based puzzle game is uh until it's finished until you can finally play it like it it's hard in your head to be like how is this fun wait you're trying to remind yourself how is this fun and then over the past four months it is one of the most fun games i've ever made um it's definitely for a strategic strategically minded persons like somebody who likes um somebody who likes stuff like uh advanced wars and um like there's a lot going on there's a lot of math um that you're doing behind the scenes there's there's a great deal of strategy and there's also a little bit of luck so you get to you get to luck out but not as much as an isaac you know you're not going to get carried completely because you got some op combo um it's balanced it's meticulously balanced um so um where is it on the scale like it's hard it's it's hard to say um i personally think it's on par with the original isaac um it's not it's not going to be it's not going to have a bazillion items you know <laughs> we don't <laughs> and people are like how many when i posted 200 items it's like but if i knew isaac has 600 it's like dude it's got <laughs> 10 years of work like <laughs> that's it's, it's expansion on expansion like you can't compare it and that's you know, kind of the corner I've painted myself into when it comes to expectations. Like people are so used to the abundance of 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 Isaac that when you present them with something a little more bite sized, they're like, "But Isaac had a thousand bosses." It is is Bumbo developed in a way? I guess the way I visualize it with like an open port on the back where you could say, "Hey, 
there's an expansion that we can kind of plug in that makes sense or is this a complete game in your opinion as it is is there anything that is in your sketchbook that didn't make it in for time or whatever reason i um yeah one so one of the reasons why we're working down to the is because of i don't know where you are but in, in california we had a bunch of cats and i lost seven days of work no internet no power you know, I'm not even living in my house. You know, most of the days we're just completely out trying to charge our phones on with our car. Where did you go? Where did you go during that time? We just drove around for the most part until our phones were charged, <laughs> got gas. And, um, we just tried to get out. We took Peach to the park and stuff like that. But at night when they're, you know, can't go on my phone because I need it in order to wake up. So I don't want to use the battery at all. Um, I broke out the sketchbook and I started sketching up what an expansion would look like if I did one. Um, and yes, I do have that. Um, but I don't know if I want to do it. We'll see. It, it definitely depends. Like if it's, if, if it's, if the reception is lukewarm, probably won't, probably won't spend time doing that. Um, if people really like it and it becomes like something that people are streaming a lot and, and, and replaying, um, and they want it, I don't see why not. I think an expansion would be relative, um, and a lot more relaxing at this point, uh, because it's easy to just expand something like this you know this is a game that more more items much like isaac more items more bosses more options usually means better i think i know the answer to this question but i want to ask it anyways does any part in your game design does any part cross your mind of saying hey how is this going to be uh, streamable how is it going to be consumed to make it like do you ever put any elements of thinking about hey like stream, I don't know the best word, but like make it stream friendly. Does that ever cross your mind or like, hey, we can do this a little bit different to make it more appealing for people to watch? The only thing that usually crosses my mind is would this be bad to stream? Like the last two games, so The End is Nigh, um, I released two years ago. And that wasn't as, like I knew going in, like a lot of people aren't going to want, want to stream this because this is kind of only for super hardcore platformer people. And anybody else is going to look stupid on stream. So that's my, that's my fear. Like there is some element of Bumbo that you look stupid on stream um, because it's kind of like playing the witness or whatever. Like you're you're trying to solve a puzzle and you're staring at the screen. And I don't know how enthralling that kind of gameplay is for streaming. I hope people will stream it and I hope people end up liking it. And that's actually why I started streaming it. I started streaming it because I wanted to see if this is something people would watch. And it somehow is. It seems strange to me still because you're literally watching me stare at the screen and being like, okay, I drag this down one, I use one. I can power this up to deal one damage to that guy that pushes that guy back and brings this guy forward. So I can, you know, next turn I can do this and this and this and this. And I, I think the way to make those streams entertaining is actually vocalizing your thoughts because you don't want to just be like, mm. <laughs> like oh, I don't, know what's, I don't know what's going on here. But yeah, it's... Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I have, I have no, I, I don't, I guess I don't. The only, the only thing I think about when making a game is like, ah, oh, this is streamable. Like, and this is the reasons why, uh, but I don't know. I, I actually taking a step back. I think that the majority of games are streamable because of the replay value. And because I think it, my themes are weird enough for people to riff off of and be funny. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot like, Watching people play now, like uh, my whole family is really constantly. In fact, they wait, say it again. You Bumble. broke are, is really into what? Sorry, you broke it up. Oh, uh, uh, my whole family is really into Bumbo currently. Mm -hmm. That's they're playing it often. Um, I told this story a few times, but I gave my my nephew a copy of it for to play test, and he's uh, he's eleven, and he was really he's like, oh cool, uh, you know. And I went over there, and he was playing it, and his dad was watching him, and as I was hanging out, his dad's start backseat gaming him being like, no, you're not doing the optimal thing here. You know, he got frustrated and he's like, oh, you just, you sit down, you do it. So he starts playing and he beats, he beats, he beats the game. And he's like, you're like, oh, I beat the game. And his wife comes over and starts watching. He gets into it. And this, this is somebody who doesn't play video games. And I, I thought, you know, a lot of this was probably fluff for me. You know, they're trying to make me feel good yeah. or whatever else. And I'm like, okay, you know, that's cute. And I leave, and then I start getting messages from Crystal, um, my, my uh, sister-in-law. Who doesn't play and games. Goes, who doesn't play games, and <laughs> she's like, she's like, uh, I got killed by Pyre. And it's like, oh, well, that's 
that's one of the end. That's one of the further bosses, a chapter three boss. I was like, oh, well, who are you playing with? And he's like, she's like, oh yeah, I unlocked Bumbo the Nimble. Like you, oh, and he's like, she's like, yeah, I started my new, I started a new save, and um, <laughs> and again, I thought like, is she just kind of fucking with me here, like just for my benefit, like what um, what's going on here? And then the next day, I find out through through my wife that Eli was late for school because both Crystal and Joe were up all night. <laughs> playing the game and and trying to trying to unlock a specific part of the game um and just today i went over to pick a uh, peach up or drop her off actually at my, at her aunt's house and uh, i look over and one of the final characters are unlocked and she's playing through and telling me how difficult it is and how she's never going to be able to beat it with this character um yeah and if that's proof of anything like uh, it i have a feeling bumbo might be a hard sell because of the match tell the match stuff but I can tell you, if you like Isaac and if you like strategy, you will definitely like it. it. It is a really fun, it makes you feel smart. It's one of those games that makes you feel like you're a genius because you figured out how to be 10 steps ahead of the game. Um, and also, secretly, if you're into any kind of match three, match four type games, you will like it. It will definitely appeal to you. It's like, imagine a really strategic version of Bejeweled. Like, Bejeweled is kind of a... Like when I approached this, it was like I want I would like to make a game like Bejeweled, but I'd like to make it good. Like and I'm, not to say Bejeweled isn't good, but it is a it is it it's is limited. one of those situ, it is one of those situations where luck is a huge factor. It's like slam slam slam, ta, 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 you know, and all these chains, and then it makes you feel good because it makes you feel it gives you the illusion that you have done something accidentally kind of happened, and it looks impressive. And I was like, I wonder if I can make a game that took that element but actually made it rigid and strategic basically how can i take bejeweled and make it less appealing to the masses? <laughs> so that's what i did um so I, I took that formula and the first thing i did was i shrunk the board down and then i made it match four and you'd be surprised how rare chains happen when you've got that kind of system in place especially with the number of of tiles and um and it became a very strategic game and it, it, it still feels puzzly, very puzzly, but it's just, if you're somebody who likes layers upon layers, see things keep opening up to you, and they, it looks deceptively simple, but it eases you in slowly, and you start realizing, like, there's just so many stuff, there's so many things you can do to manipulate the board in so many different ways, and then you've got to maintain, it's like you're playing this little mini game here, and then you've got this, this line, this line over here is a bunch of cells that let you break the rules and then break each other. Like, so you're, you're trying to do these kind of Isaac strategies and the game's an actually, a, it's a draft game. So it's not like you're just going in and getting one item. You choose from specific items and the game actually knows what you have. So it tries to strategize with you and make sure you don't get redundant things. Um, that, that don't mean anything to your character. So there's actually draft archetypes. You can draft like a super defensive build. You can draft a hyper aggressive build. You can gra draft this like chainy combo -y type build. And uh, then once you finish a level in the game, you can actually edit your spells and modify them in different ways, which adds a whole other le 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 layer of complexity. For, for you, there's a lot going on. For you playing the game, what was the most surprising or most fun part of the game? that you had not develop, developing it, but actually playing it. Is there anything that you're like, wow, this is really fun and I didn't expect this part of the game to be that fun? Yeah, the streams. The streams that I did, like, I do a lot of rigid play testing where I'm just trying to beat the game. So I'm just doing whatever. But a lot of times, like recently, um, there's an item called Chaos. There's a lot of items that are referenced to Isaac. And um, uh, the Chaos item adds a wild and a curse. So Curse tiles are bad, wilds are wilds, so they're gonna eat, you're gonna combo off those wilds more. And it became a gamble. I just I, I I just drafted into a gamble. I'm just gonna gamble. Like that's all I'm gonna do this whole time. And I screwed myself over multiple times and then I but I somehow made it through and I made it through the first chapter. I've only been spoiling the first chapter. And then I played it again and it was a completely different experience. And those were the things that really stuck out to me or watching my wife play and being like, you just made the most, that was the stupidest move in the world. <laughs> How are you going to dig yourself out of this horrible hole you put yourself into? There's no way. And she does. And it's, 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 there's a lot of that. There's a lot of, Oh my God, how, am, how in the hell am I going to survive this next turn? And you do it, you do it. Um, 
and those are the those are the, the points where I'm like, oh wow, like this is actually really good. Like this is this is a really good game, and it's up right up there with all my others. That's exciting. And and as we wrap up stuff here, for you as someone who's been in the industry and has done a lot and made a lot of games, for you, what is the best part about what you get to do that we may not understand as like consumers or people that play your games? For you, what's like the most re- rewarding part about doing what you do and and making these games that people love to play. Definitely the most rewarding part would just probably be being able to do whatever I want. I, I, have, I literally have the freedom to do whatever I want. And that's for me, like that's the most valuable thing you can give me because growing up, you know, you have limitations and how are you going to live off of dick jokes? You know, you can't, you can't, <laughs> well, maybe some people can, <laughs> but uh, yeah, like I, the freedom, the freedom, the creative freedom that I that I'm that I have at this point, and that's by far the most rewarding. It makes releasing a game sucks. I mean, I'm so stressed out. Why do and you this say is, that? This is I'm, I'm I'm glad that you invited me on. Relax. I can stop thinking about the stresses of what I need to get done and worrying about how people are going to receive the game and worried about reviews. That's the thing I'm worried about the most now is because like I do want reviews for the game but the game still isn't completely complete and is not going to be complete until release. So it's like, I'm going to give people review copies and just hope and pray that they're forgiving when it comes to, comes to the game might crash or there might not all the sounds are in the game and the game's not completely polished. Um, so I stress out about that sort of stuff and be like, Oh, you know, someone's going to ruin me. Kotaku's going to ruin me on, on release day. You know, I get, I get paranoid about that sort of stuff and I just get stressed out overall. So you say like but, in terms of the most challenging part about what you do, is it, reading those reviews and the uncertainty of those reviews coming in that's the most challenging yeah. it goes from and i'm so, like a very contr- controlling person i need to control everything you know so it goes from i have control over everything everything is under my i have no control at all and everyone else like it's all it's gone now i i can't touch it i can't do anything to it and i can't stop people from saying or doing whatever they want with it and sometimes it, it can be so harsh and like, like, I don't want to sound super artsy fartsy, but both James and I put a lot of our personal experience and I can't explain why, because you'd have to beat the game to know what I'm talking about. But, um, there's a significant tie into this game, obviously. And the final cutscene in it is significant to how these things go together. And it's also a personal thing. And there's a lot of emotion and feeling that go, goes into it it goes into all my work i just kind of dress it up in cute disgusting ways so it kind of makes it harder to see um it makes it more comfortable for me to read my poetry my 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 uh, emo poetry to to the masses you know i get to dress it up with big eyes and and poop you know and people don't have to take it too seriously but for us it's it, it can feel harsh like it criticism can sometimes feel you know, devastating if it hits you in that right, in that right way where it feels like, you know, you're a joke in some way. Um, and that hasn't really happened much to me, but the fear is always there, of course, to the feeling of being exposed um, and feeling like, oh, you know, the emo kid, crybaby. <laughs> that, know, that, know. Well, that's really interesting to hear for someone who's had as much success as you've had in terms of making games that people love that a bad review like would you rather let me ask this would you rather have a million people love the game with bad reviews or would you rather have great reviews and 10,000 people love the game yeah I, I could i could brush off a bad review but there's the paranoia is always there i'm always worried that something will go drastically wrong you know i don't know it's it's just part of my personality i guess i I, I and that's probably why I push myself more and more and more just to make sure the probabilities are lower, lower and lower. Um, but it's definitely there. It, it's I wish it wasn't. I really wish it wasn't because I've I've released so many games over the years and they're I all good. they're today, all good. They're all well, like, well yeah. thank you, well thank you. But I, I I I like today I'm like feeling pins and needles in my arm and face. I'm dying. I'm gonna have a stroke on the you know and it's like. What? It's like, this is super Meat Boy stuff. Like, why am I, why? Like, why am I, why does it still bother me and stress me out so much? But it is, it's that lack of power. Like, it's it's that relinquishing of control over something that is yours, and it isn't yours anymore. It is everybody else's, and it's, it's, uh, you feel powerless. 
in, in a weird way. And I understand like there's so many developers out there that will work on a game forever and they'll never release it. I understand why. Totally get it. Like because it can be it can feel like something is just stolen. Like your your happiness, your baby, your child that you've been working ripped from your arms and you don't want to give that up. Um, you want it to be perfect. You want to nurture it and you want to make it as good as possible. But at some point you got to cut it off and ship it because it's an adult. It's done. <laughs> like, um, and that is still, that is still hard. It is still hard. Well, speaking of, and I want to wrap things up here on a high note, you know, not, not that, you know, versus the challenging stuff. So, <laughs> so you have a daughter and, you know, how has she affected or at all, does she affect like how you approach your games now? Or is it like, hey, that's family man, Edmund, or is there, has she, I don't wanna say softened your heart at all, but like has being a dad influenced any of your narratives or how you approach the game? Or is it just like a separate that, part of your life? Or is that, that not a that's fair question? That I think we'll have to look and see because when she was just being born is when I kind of started working. Mm -hmm. And the end is nigh was a little bit like when she was born as well. So like the end is nigh kind of was about questioning what I was doing. Like, should I stop obsessively working? I should be a family man. This is more important to see that this being, being, being a husband and a father is a million times more important than all the dumb shit that I'm doing when I'm playing poop games. And, and it's like, well, is it time to make that sacrifice? Like, is it, is the, is it worth it? Like, um, and I got to kind of explore that with the end is nigh. Um, but I don't know, like, I'm positive that the next couple games that I release, she'll have some influence over for the most part, but the end is nice so far is the only one where it was just kind of contemplating my future. And when it came to choosing family over, over work and the way th she's changed things is I've, you know, I've reprioritized my life. I've taken a step back from the heavy lifting, um, I used to be so controlling that I would have to do everything, anything that had to do with something I can do. Anything but programming is I was doing it 100%. Like it was all me. Um, and then working on the end is nigh with Tyler. Um, and this was hard for me to do. I let him make some of the levels. He made all the secret levels, which is, oh, that was hard. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and I've learned to like loosen up. And when I, when I made Souls, uh, the card, it was my yeah, card game. game. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was hard for me to be like, I'm, I, I can, I need to admit the fact that I can do all the art for all these cards. And there are a million other people that can do it better. I out to with some, some in the past. Um, and I was like, Hey, you want to do this? I can't like, I can work. I can do the design and I can play test. But when it comes to like the hundreds of cards, I simply can't. And I concede. Um, because I would like to spend time with my wife and kids, but now I have a schedule. It's kind of weird. Like, for oh man for like at least 12 years i had the most chaotic schedule you could ever imagine where we would do this thing called flipping so what we would do is our 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 schedule would slowly go from like you know 10 in the morning to noon to to two to four to six and then once it started we started waking up when it was dark we we're like shit gotta gotta spin this over now and we would just stay up for 24 hours like 24 hours again, sleep for eight hours, and you'd flip over to the early schedule and you start waking up at one in the morning. Um, and then, you know, the, it's a totally, and we did this for 12 years. Like, and this was, this was like every, every change, every, sometimes every three months we would do it. Super unhealthy, bad, bad for you to do overall. And when we had Peach, it was like, well, that's, what the hell are we That's not happening. Do? No, no <laughs> chance that's not happening. So um, just this past year, we finally like got to get our shit together. She started to go to preschool. So I've basically budgeted my time. I have a schedule and I, and I work from this time to this time and I cut it off. Not to say I can stop. I still usually will get immersed in thought and sketch the st stuff down when I'm not working. But I have a schedule now and I do have money so I can hire people that are actually more skilled than me when it comes to illustration work and stuff like that to do that stuff. And that's, that's it. I mean, basically just to kind of taking a step back, need to play more of a director role and, and I, need, I just can't do it all myself. And the end is now this game that I will do, be doing super heavy lifting on, like, uh, from, from here on it, I gotta, I gotta lean on other people. I'm done making sacrifices for my family. I'm, I'm, I, it's more important and it's more fun. Honestly, I, I do really enjoy spending time with my family and I, 
I'd like to do it more often. That's cool. All right. Last two questions for you. Number one, you've already left a lasting legacy on the industry, you know, and people have varying opinions on that and, you know, how you've moved the genre and, and just invented so much. What do you hope your legacy, when it's all said and done, what do you hope your legacy in the industry is in terms of you say, hey, this is what I think or I want them to say about what I've done or what you felt like you've done? I don't. I, I really don't know. I've never really. Um, I'd be fine with just about anything. <laughs> <laughs> but um, um, for me, it's just like, I hope that by the time I die, that I'm able to create enough stuff to paint a really good picture of who I am. Um, and that's basically what I'm trying to do. Like I'm giving little bits and pieces of my personality, my personal experience and everything else. I'm putting little bits and pieces of me in everything. And I'd hope that by the end of my career that enough people will have gotten to know me. Um, and that's all I can really say. Like as an artist, that's all, you, that's the only thing that you have that, to offer. Um, that's unique. You know, um, there's only one me and I tried my best to put that in what I'm doing. And the reason I ask, cause I know there's a, a lot of people that look up to you in multiple facets, but say right now there's a young Edmund looking at you saying, Hey, this is what I want to do. And it's a very different environment now in 2019 and 2020 than when you started. What is your best to Edmund Jr. out there that wants to make games or has a passion like you? How would you have, what advice or what executable action would you tell that developer, him or her, to get started now? What, what do you, what? I, I, and I'm being super honest about yeah. this. And this will apply to anybody who's honest with themselves about the amount of work they need to get where they want to be. Do something every day for, as you, you don't stop. Do at least one thing every day to further your career in some way. If you're, if you're smart and strategic, and you probably are if this is what you're considering, um, do something every day that you, th that you know will somehow aid you in the future. If it's making sure you're drawing as much as possible because you want to hone that craft, if, if it's programming and rapid prototyping, if it's networking and just getting to know people, if it's just being social, if it's just playing games to understand the mechanics, if it's reading books and watching movies so you understand how to do storytelling, do something and be conscious of the fact that you're doing it because it's you will not stop. Like it, you, it gets exponentially easier as you go. That's how that works. Like. It's little stepping stones and don't get frustrated with it because it's a life. It's a, it's a lifestyle choice. This isn't, this isn't even my career. It's, it is me. Like this is my life. And this is what I've been doing for, for forever. Um, and if you live it and it makes you happy, that's all that really matters. Like do what you can to stay happy and make enough money in order to live. And it's just a balance of those things. And then primarily that's what I would say to be honest with what you need to make yourself happy. And, strive for that as your career it doesn't matter what it is i apply to anything like you will get there eventually if you just keep moving forward and you make good decisions like my wife and i put off having a baby like we waited wait don't have a baby when you're young <laughs> like don't try try to try to avoid try to avoid as many you know it's another i like i don't drink and i don't do drugs like I try, I try to stay as in reality as I possibly can. And I try to optimize the chances of, of success versus failure. And that's how I live. And if you just, I, I just, I don't know if, if you keep doing what you can and you do it every day, it's just like, I mean, it's just like streaming. It's just like everything else. It's, it's about consistency. It's about showing your worth, you, you know, showing who you are and um, honing your craft, you know, optimizing your your day-to-day -day and, and and building a name for yourself you know it, it, i think you know i've learned a lot about you in this interview and i think it's really cool like for all the success you've had you seem super humble you seem very self-aware and and really willing to reveal like the good stuff and the bad stuff about the journey you've been on and you know i know not that you need me to root for you, but such a likable guy and, and, you know, very grateful to have the opportunity to do this, but also, you know, experience everything you've made and, and uh, you know, Bumbo comes out 
next week on November 12th. For people that are listening that have never heard of it, could you explain it to them in like a first grade explanation of what it is and why they'd want to play it? Um, I'll try. Yeah. I'm, still, I'm still working on this one because <laughs> people keep asking me and I'm like, Ooh. Uh, The Legend of Bumbo. Number one, it's a so the vibe is very, very Isaac and the story eventually does make sense to Isaac. Um, but it is a turn-based strategy game where you use a match four puzzle board system in order to gain mana and different attacks to to fuel spells, which there are hundreds of, um, that interact with one another to fight off enemies, like waves of enemies coming towards you. Kind of like a, a turn-based, a really strategic turn-based plants versus zombies. That's a good way to put it, I guess. There's your there's your one sentence. Uh, <laughs> oh, there's very poop. There's poop. <laughs> it, uh, but instead of instead of just colors, you've got teeth. You've got rotten teeth. You've got bones. You've got hearts. You've got poop. You've got pee and boogers. That's what you use. Bumbo uses his trash like he has a bag of trash, and he uses it to like manipulate and like cast spells. And that's uh, that was the idea anyway. So a strategic plants versus zombies with poop. That's. Like sure. First... Yes. <laughs> ship it. Ship it. Whatever. 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 Uh, if you like. If you like the Binding of Isaac, Plants vs. Zombies, Puzzle Quest, Dicey Dungeon, Slay the Spire. It's like those games. <laughs> <laughs> whatever. 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 Yeah, it's fun. It is. If you the proof's in the pudding, though. Just look. Look at any of the videos that I've. Follow me on Twitter at Edwin McMillan. Um, at Edwin McMillan. Um, you can see I post tons of updates. I li- I've been live streaming almost every day, um, except for this. I'm, this. I'm counting this as stream for the day. Real, real um, quick, live streaming. Do you like it? Do you not like it? Do you have a certain amount of I don't respect? Know how you guys, how or, do you do this? Or like, di- this is, do you respect live know. streamers more or disrespect them more? I've, I've, always, <laughs> I've always respected them. I've had long talks with them um, whenever I've gone on the show in the past off, off camera, and it's just like, I feel for you guys. You, what you're doing, what you do is taxing. You definitely have to have a certain personality type, and definitely an extroverted person to keep it moving, keep the happy face on, get up and do it. <laughs> like, I, I'm the kind of person who would have a little fun and then say, fuck, it, and I just move away from it and let that be it. And like, if I get the wild hair to do whatever, you know, I, I, I feel for you. It's, 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 um, to make a career and money off of it. You got to, I, I have mad respect for all of you. I'll it's tell you a what, lot, a it, lot, a lot of work. It, it makes it a lot easier when we have fun games to play and, and lucky for us, you know, you made a ton of fun games, but Edmund in the middle of crunch time, thank you so, so much for taking time out to come on the podcast, man, and uh, wish you nothing but success. We'll be playing Bumble on launch day, but man, best of luck to you. And, and uh, I look forward to watching you and continuing to follow your success. Cool, yeah, I'll get you a code, actually. I'll send you a code. You play early. Dude, I'd Just love don't to. Stre- don't stream it till the day before. I, I'm fine with people streaming it on uh, Monday. I wasn't uh, going to ask, but you know you know what I've learned from you? I need to ask. So I can. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. So when can I stream it? Uh, Monday after 10 in can, the morning. Can I stream it at Monday at 9 a.m.? No. Okay. So you specific specific standard time. Okay. So sometimes you get yeses, sometimes you get no. You know. But yeah. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> thanks so much for coming on, Admin. Best of luck, man. All right. I will talk to you thanks soon. Thanks for having me on. Of Take course, man. Later.